Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the seventh edition of Monetary Policy Conference. Um, yet another year where we have been very lucky uh, attracting um, a wonderful uh, set of submissions from which our selection committee could pick a <coughs> very excellent, uh, say, li lineup of papers. You will see the papers today and tomorrow, and uh, I'm, I'm sure, surely, they will uh, stimulate uh, a very lively debate, as, as they have in the past. So what what's I find very striking this year is the diversity, not diversity in terms of quality, because as I said, it's, it's a very elevated uniformly, but um, diversity in terms of methods, econometric methods that are used, uh, sets of data, so data sets uh, that are uh, used in, the, in those papers, creative ways of splicing uh, data spans that otherwise would be too short you not know, to support good econometric inference, and particularly, and that I would really uh, want to underscore, diversity of policy implications. No, because this is a conference whose pur purpose is to bridge uh, practice and theory, and there is where we care a lot about policy implications. And um, uh, let me make one example of this uh, policy implication, say contrast. Uh, there is one paper that you will see in the morning, it's coming up uh, shortly, that finds that at monetary policy or central banks not constrain themselves, hamstrung themselves to uh, constraints, to policy rules of their own making, uh, inflation would have been materially, measurably lower, okay, in these three years of inflation crisis. And that was because um, these rules were blunting policy response at a very early stage of the, of the crisis. Okay, so that's a very important result that needs to be taken seriously, needs to be studied further, and, uh, and so on. There is another paper, however, <clears throat> that comes a little bit later today that also challenges policy, but from uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, I would say, uh, saying, look, um, central banks, watch out not to take out too much insurance you know, against uh, inflation coming back, because that may be costly in terms of lost output. And uh, this loss of output could last uh, for a very long time, you know, even 10 years or longer. So there is, they, they find no strong evidence supporting monetary neutrality. And, you know our foundation on monetary neutrality has been for generations of economists, both inside and outside central banks. Okay, so um, in my view, a conference like this, again, bridging theory and, and, and practice is very good value for money because uh, by running this sort of horse races between models, but by the way, there, is, there are lots of model simulations also in the in the papers that we'll see, so between models, between theories, between empirics, um, it solidifies our analysis, our internal, especially central bank uh, analysis. It makes it, so offers way to cross-evaluate that analysis so that it doesn't become too stale, not too uh, outdated, uh, too partial, too one-sided, you know, and in that, in that way, uh, it contributes indirectly to uh, making policy choices uh, wiser and more robust. So that's, that's all on my side. Uh, um, there is a, a keynote speech coming up uh, right now, and uh, I will invite uh, Philip Lane, our chief economist, a member of the ECB board and governing council, to come on stage. and. Uh, and uh, for his speech, and uh, from me, let me just wish you all a very good conference. Thank you. So, uh, good morning. I, I think this series, uh, Bridging uh, Science and Practice, has a very good uh, uh, philosophy behind it because, in fact, um, you know, we would try hard, I think, every day, every meeting to indeed uh, bridge the science and the practice. So in other words, uh, those of you who are coming from the scientific academic community, 
should know that, of course, you like citations, but the impact of your work goes beyond citation because here, uh, anything that we, we think is interesting will be uh, reverse engineered, it will be absorbed into the policy process, and there is a fairly quick transmission from the science uh, to the practice. Uh, now, not necessarily in a wholesale, unmodified way, uh, but there, there is a lot of transmission, and of course, one way uh, to transmit your ideas is to submit to these conferences to come along uh, and to, to explain your work. Uh, so, of course, I'm coming uh, from the practice end of this, uh, and uh, my, my goal today is, is to run through uh, some issues about the transmission of monetary policy. And again, from my, my point of view, uh, in, in terms of communicating here, it, it's really to raise a set of issues that may be helpful for those of you who need to think about how to develop frameworks, how to develop models. So the intention here is not to have a, a silver bullet saying, well, this is the key to understanding everything. The intention is actually to try and say, well, look, uh, when you're trying to go meeting by meeting at uh, developing policy, here's the range of issues that we, we have to think about. Um, so, so that's my goal today. Uh, this kind of continues or, or builds on, on uh, the uh, paper I wrote for the Jackson Hole Conference uh, a couple of months ago. And so what, what I want to do is uh, focus, first of all, on the transmission to, to, through the financial system. Second, uh, the transmission to the economy. Third, the transmission to inflation expectations. So that's all, okay, where do we see monetary policy being effective? But then I also want to say, okay, in, in calibrating monetary policy, in deciding how much monetary tightening you actually need, you have to take into account the nature of the shocks hitting the economy. And during this period, it's very important to take into account the sectoral nature of these shocks the energy shock, the asymmetry of how the pandemic at different points in time affected different sectors uh, is very important. I think it's very important to take a balance sheet view, but when we take a balance sheet view, to remember balance sheets are interconnected. So for example, the level of, of public debt is, is not uh, independent of what's going on with private sector balance sheets. Uh, and then I'll make some conclusions. Okay, so in thinking about uh, financial transmission, uh, I think the first graph on the left is quite important. So this shows you the, the policy rate path, but what actually happened and uh, what was expected at different points in time and what is currently expected. And if you go back to December 21, uh, we view December 21 uh, as a pivot point because essentially that was the, f the date at which we kind of drew a line under the scale of, of quantitative easing. At that point, it was still in principle open to us to extend it, for example, the PEP program. We said no, uh, the PEP will end as indicated in March 22. And we also uh, scaled the amount of, uh, the expected amount of APP in, in 22 as well. And so that, that point is, is important, but it's important to remember at that point the market expected us not to raise rates into positive territory for no, at least another five years. So you see there that, that the forward rate was still negative even through 27, or just about going to zero in 27. So already inflation had picked up, and I'm sure there's gonna be papers today saying, well, you know, it is obvious that rates should already have been higher by, by December 21. But the market did not expect, it still expected us to be basically in a very low for long regime for, for you know, indefinitely. Of course, that's not what happened. Uh, we, we raised rates. Then the red line is important. That's, that's the point of view from December 22. So by December 22, rates were, was up, were up to 2%. There was an expectation at that point that they would go into three something um, uh, before, uh, coming back down. Uh, and then you see uh, where we were in September, the green line, that the, you know, yes, there's a cut in September and there'll be, you know, cuts uh, thereafter. And then the light blue line is latest, where 
there, there's a different expectation of, of where we're going. But maybe uh, what's important here is on top of the reaction to inflation about what was happening in terms of hiking, the destination looks very different. So uh, throughout this period, there was confidence that the medium term inflation rate would get back to 2%. But the interest rate deemed to be consistent with that uh, looks like it was something around two, two and a half. So we're going from a policy rate of minus 0 0.5 before the crisis, uh, when essentially medium term inflation expectations uh, were not two, but they were not you know, hugely below two, to a, a, a situation where medium term inflation expectations are 2%, that the policy rate is two, two and a half. So in other words, on top of the cyclical response of interest rates, there was also a long-term repricing here. So the long-term repricing what was that essentially we would not be at the lower bound. Uh, we would be maybe, a lot of discussion says, well, maybe you're going to be around neutral in the longer term. And, that's, and the market thinks neutral is somewhere consistent with that. So when we think about monetary transmission, normally we think about a cyclical change in the interest rate. But on top of that cyclical change in the interest rate, we had this long-term change in the interest rate as well. And that is significant when you think about how much should uh, consumers be responding, how much should investors res be responding, asset prices be responding. And this is, you know, it's not exactly the same for the Fed because that long-term, uh, there has been a long-term movement in the interest rate in the US as well, but, but not of the same scale. Okay, so, so that's one. Uh, second point in the middle is about the, the kind of timeline here. So the middle uh, chart shows you the t 10 minus two spread. So, so the 10 year yield minus the two year yield. And, and before the, uh, the shock, this was positive, and again, consistent with people understanding in the near term, interest rates would be low, but eventually they'd come back to something more normal. Then uh, when inflation took off, we hiked the short end. But again, because there was confidence that inflation would get back to target fairly, in a fairly timely manner, the long end did not move so much. And of course, this is very important for a transmission, for example, at, for example, to the sovereign bond market, where the 10-year rate is very important, for example. Um, and uh, now, more recently, it's coming up again uh, as we, the interest rate cycle has, has moved. But let me emphasize behind this, we do think the term premium has gone up. We do think uh, quantitative tightening does mean that the, the compression of term premia is, is softening. And uh, the right side shows the balance sheet of the ECB, where you can see there's been a fairly rapid uh, decline in the size of the balance sheet. Now, so far, it's been mostly the Teltro program coming close to an end, uh, but there's been some uh, decline in the bond portfolios as well. And again, this is a, a topic, understanding how that amount of uh, withdrawal of liquidity from the system matters it is going to be a very uh, important area for research in the years to come. Even if so far it's been obscured a little bit by, by the dynamics of the short-term rate versus the long-term rate um, so far. Okay, so in, in the European uh, economy, the banking system is very important. So the typical firm and the typical household turns to the banks for financing. That's not entirely true. There's plenty of non-bank financing as well. Um, and we, we've had various conferences recently where the non-bank intermediation has been important. But for SMEs especially, for households, uh, the banking system is very important. And there's a couple of issues about transmission which are included in the left chart. So one, the red line shows you the cost of funding to the banks, which has gone up by about uh, 200 basis points, from about zero to about two. So it's not one for one with, with the uh, policy rate, because of course banks raise long-term financing from the bond market, and most obviously they, they have a lot of deposits. And the, the pricing of those deposits, to put it mildly, is not one to one with the policy rate. 
Um, but in any event, there has been a significant... So, so the, this matters in both directions. When we tighten, uh, overall bank funding costs do not go up one for one. But equally, when we loosen, bank funding costs do not go, go down one for one. And this is, you know, for us as kind of uh, practitioners, this is kind of a, a fact, a fact of life that we deal with. So in calibrating transmission, if you're running a model where you're super stripped down and you have the policy rate summarizing financial costs, uh, you know, you're not going to do very well. because The intermediation uh, is very important. The other point uh, to notice here is, uh, so for, for firms where you might typically think maybe two year out funding costs are important, uh, the, the cost of, of, of a bank loan went up by about three percentage points and less, less for mortgages. Uh, the other point to note, which of course many people have talked about, is now compared, not a, you know, there's been a lot of fixed rate uh, mortgages issued over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, so, so this means that for many households, they did not face immediately the rising mortgage costs. But over time, uh, as those fixes roll off, they, they will face it. So in other words, in a do nothing scenario, that there is ongoing tightening from the fact that more and more people who took out a fix at very low rates will, will face higher rates when they refinance. So it's important also uh, to remember th that the lending rates do not summarize everything to do with banks. It's also important how banks uh, make decisions in terms of the terms and conditions they offer. And uh, what you can see here is a pretty steep turnaround. So more or less in, in the low for long period, and of course with a lot of liquidity, a lot of belief that, that uh, the monetary conditions would be loose indefinitely, banks uh, compared to 2014 loosened or weakened their lending criteria. But you saw since then uh, there's been this campaign, uh, you know, quarter after quarter of tightening. Uh, and so the cumulative amount of tightening you see there. So banks have changed their behavior quite a bit. Uh, so in other words, the, the kind of willingness to extend credit has, has changed quite a bit. And this is a, a credit supply uh, dimension, uh, which, of course, we will continue to, 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 tr to track. And then maybe, uh, again, in terms of empirics, uh, on the right, it's important to see is that uh, during the pandemic and then uh, when energy prices became so high in 2022, there was a lot of short-term credit offered to firms. Um, but what you see here, the big story here, is both household credit and firm credit basically going from uh, uh, positive growth rates to basically zero um, and being persistently around zero. So in terms of uh, the mix of credit demand, so firms and households deciding in this world we don't want to borrow, but also credit supply, firms, uh, banks being more reluctant to lend. Uh, on net, what we've got is basically a big shift in the credit dynamic. And in turn, uh, depending on your favorite model, that credit dynamic will map into real activity. Okay, you might say, well, you know, um, all of that, uh, maybe it, uh, uh, that didn't affect the real economy. So tell me about how the real economy was affected. So if I go back to uh, uh, December 21, and I, I look at the forecast we made then, we basically had a strong recovery from the pandemic. This is just bounce back. It's not a kind of economic miracle in Europe, but just a, a kind of reasonable bounce back from, from the pandemic was expected. With a strong 22, but also a strong 23 and, and a decent 24. So the green lines basically had pretty strong uh, recovery throughout these years. Uh, now, it, it turned out that 22 was you know, a good year, but not as strong as was expected. So if you recall, around March 22, the European economy finally reopened, because uh, we did have the Omicron wave at the start of 22. And so there's a big recovery in contact intensive activity and so on. Um, but look, look at 23. There was something happened, or more, at least one thing happened between the end of 21 and 23 to cause this really big revision in the performance of the European economy. 
And you might say, well, that's the war. Yes, it's the war to some extent, but the war is from the start of 22. So, um, and also with the energy prices, by, you know, in 22 they went up a lot, but in 23 they were already recovering. So uh, absolutely there was an effect of the pandemic and in terms of trade shock, uh, but at the very least it's not inconsistent with monetary policy having played a role in slowing down the European economy. And again, uh, this is something to be discussed. Uh, and then when you think about the components of activity, in the middle panel, you know, if you can see it, uh, you can see the different contributions of different spending categories. And for 2022, what's important is in the middle of 22, we still have pretty strong consumption growth. So, uh, and, and this, I think, uh, matters quite a bit for many macro models of monetary policy and this period. So that, that strong consumption growth in 22, uh, it's either people... Uh, spending down their pandemic savings, because this is now the first time you could go on holiday, uh, re resume normal consumption behavior, and you see a strong rebound from that, or you look at relatively high inflation and monetary policy, which was only starting to adjust in mid-22. And you say very negative real interest rates stimulated consumption in the middle of 22. So the balance between uh, essentially the rebound in, in, in the, from the pandemic versus uh, a clash between accommodative monetary policy um, uh, is, is, I think, that 22 period uh, will cut across a lot of things. And you have to take a stand about what's going on there. But anyway, in, in 23, 24, consumption has been uh, very subdued. And again, given the terms of trade were improving in this period, uh, given unemployment uh, has been low, and on the right chart, given that consumer confidence has been improving, albeit from a low point, uh, there is an open question about why the savings rate now is so high. So the right panel basically shows you the savings rate. It shows you that real incomes have been improving for quite a while now, but consumption is basically horizontal. And the question is, you know, you can build uncertainty stories, which I buy, uh, to some extent, but you also have to ask, is it the case that relatively high interest rates, compared to what people are used to, and importantly, in the expectation, they're going to remain more than the uh, lower bound levels indefinitely, has that changed uh, savings behavior? And this includes the Q2 data, and you can just see the yawning gap between income and, and consumption at the moment. Okay, so uh, throughout this period, we emphasized um, that, that uh, the goal of monetary tightening uh, was to dampen demand and to stabilize inflation expectations. Uh, and so let me uh, just make a couple of points about inflation expectations. So number one, uh, the pre-pandemic starting point, so that the blue line is Q4 2019, had the anchoring to the downside. Uh, our inflation target of 2%, or close to 2%, if you want to be uh, refined about it, uh, people believe that either we would be happy enough with anything around 1.5, 1.6, or they believe, well, you may not be happy, but with the lower band, you can't do much about it. And so you see there, most, a lot of the distribution was well below 2%. And uh, what's happened uh, fairly quickly, so the Q4-22, already, uh, but even earlier than that, there's a recentering of expectations at 2%. So one element of this pandemic shock has basically be, been, to, been a wake-up call, that inflation is not structurally condemned to be below target. Inflation shocks can happen. And uh, if the ECB says it wants 2%, and the analyst community believes we will hit 2% in the medium term. So, so again, uh, this is something for us, uh, for maybe some other central banks as well, the opportunistic re-anchoring of inflation expectations. What's an also important, and it has been relevant for policy, is also the right tail. And what you see here is at the end of 22, and that's when inflation was peaking, 
there was a non-trivial amount of people in the survey who believed that inflation actually would be indefinitely away from 2%. Uh, so here, uh, it's 25 and above is the last data point. And what's happened since then is people now believe, actually, that, that the risk distribution is not so one-sided. Um, and so, the, so that right tail has also calmed down. And that, that I think, is, is important. Uh, maybe, so th that, that's about longer term. What's also important, and we said throughout this period, was uh, we want a timely return of inflation to the target. That's partly just the mandate that, that we don't want to be too uh, forgiving of ourselves with the medium term orientation. We want inflation to be close to target in a timely manner. Um, and what you see throughout, if you see the gray lines, which is the term structure of the expectations, <laughs> Throughout, okay, they were, <laughs> there's a long period where they keep on revising where the peak inflation would be, but whenever peak inflation would be hit, it wouldn't take that long to come back down to targets. And the blue line is what's actually happened. And what you see is, you know, uh, slope-wise, it looks very similar to what people expected. So they're resetting the peak, but the slope has been fairly stable. Understand that inflation would not collapse to 2% immediately there are lags in the transmission system, but more or less a fairly steep return. And in fact, you see in recent surveys, the data has been uh, better than the expectation. So in fact, the, uh, the speed of disinflation has been faster than has been expected in recent surveys. Okay, that, that's, that's the professionals, something similar you would get from uh, market-based analysis. So, so let me turn to the consumers and the firms. And uh, a number of features of the consumer expectation survey, and we had a whole conference uh, related to this last week, uh, is number one, um, that essentially, so only show from the peak onwards, but actually in the run-up, uh, the perceived inflation, past inflation, was very close to the run-up. So consumers were, were very aware of the run-up of inflation. So perceived inflation was very close. But what's interesting is in the, in, in the disinflation period, they've been slow to mark down inflation. So, so the speed of marking down their uh, perception of inflation, it's not been zero. So you see eventually it's there, but you can see there's a pretty big lag in the system. Uh, so, so the speed of, of acknowledging inflation is coming down has been a lot slower than the actual disinflation, uh, which I think is interesting. The one year ahead is interesting. One year ahead uh, uh, you know, is influenced clearly by past inflation, but again, it's coming down. So one of the big questions, I think, in many models and many under, you know, policy discussions is what is the causal role of the one year ahead expectation? So is it the case that simply they're good macroeconomists, they know an impulse response, response function, and they know inflation's not going to go to target immediately? So the one year ahead is basically uh, reasonably close to, to what a macro model would say. So in other words, they might be extrapolating, but extrapolating in a way that's not too bad. Um, and so I think that's important because in many models, it sounds like it's a causal role for one year ahead expectations. And then this the kind of medium term, there was a bump, but it's confounded because the bump in the long term inflation expectation was concentrated in March 2022, at the start of the war. So why did the median uh, inflation, long-term inflation forecast go from two, two point something to three in one reading, and then was persistent for quite a while? The fact it was in March 22 makes it difficult to tell apart a generalized response to the war shock versus uh, a kind of, you know, uh, uh, cure, you know, uh, lagged uh, response to this severe inflation in 22, uh, in 21, 22, which was now going to be with the war clearly longer. And then a, an important new innovation at the ECB uh, is the extending the safe survey to include inflation expectations. And uh, what you see here is, you know, over time, uh, firms are recognizing that expect inflation is coming down. And what's also important is the distribution is narrowing. So the, the right tail uh, of firms is also accepting that we're returning to uh, more or less a target inflation rate. So what I would say there here is, 
this is still a, a very, uh, I think, unsettled area about exactly thinking about the, the role of inflation expectations. But we do get reassurance from the fact that lots of these indicators are, are improving. Okay, um, what, what I want to do now is, is uh, switch to, to um, calibration issues. So if you go back to uh, 21, but especially 22, exactly how much tightening and how quickly the tightening should be was well, obviously what was confronting um, us and confronting the monetary policy group who had to advise us on, on, on what to do. And here, uh, what I would say is, I think it's important to take into account the sectoral natures of the shocks. Um, and so there's many ways to cut the data, but what I'm going to do here is to use the uh, ECB implementation of the Bernanke uh, uh, Blanchard model. Uh, so, so a group of ECB economists uh, you know, implemented it. Now, this is what I'm showing here is ex post. It's today's, it's been updated through Q224. And of course, um, uh, but at the same time, I think it, it maps fairly well to, to uh, the, the way that the inflation was being analyzed at the time. Uh, and again, uh, uh, I think a, a number of features here it, it is, um, so the initial conditions is basically what the pre-pandemic pre set of conditions would have delivered in terms of inflation throughout. So essentially is kind of below target uh, throughout. Uh, so we were in a below target world uh, and essentially without shocks, most likely we, we'd have stayed in that world. So, so the way uh, this model works is it, it uh, has a, a fairly macro view uh, and so the macro kind of uh, dynamics are basically funneled through the labor market. So, so the orange boxes here are the labor market, is labor market tightness uh, captured by the vacancy unemployment ratio. And what you see here is the labor market before the pandemic was not seen as tight, and it is tighter now. So the orange boxes have played a role. But you might say, well, they've played a role, but uh, clearly they've been, uh, it looks small compared to, to, to the uh, shocks. So the shocks here are energy, uh, food, and uh, supply chains, so bottlenecks. Uh, and uh, the, red, the red boxes are, are the energy shocks. And it's important to say these kind of stopped basically at the end of 22. So inflation, of course, uh, did not collapse to, zero, to, to target at the end of 22. But the energy shock uh, has basically uh, been playing its role through lags since then. And in fact, it's played a negative role in some, some of the quarters. What you see here is, and again, the value of this model, because it's been implemented elsewhere, is the, the bottlenecks have played a bigger role in the European economy and a more persistent role than in the equivalent US estimation. So bottlenecks have played a role in, in the uh, European uh, dynamic, and the persistence of inflation is something that I think that's uh, striking. And then uh, the, the energy and food shocks. Food, by the way, is kind of, a, again, an unsettled category. What exactly is food in terms of a macro model? Because it's some mix of commodity, uh, some mix, especially processed food, of, of a manufactured good, some mix of a service, because of course food, uh, you have to buy from a local supermarket and so on. So, so there's a, a real range of factors going into what food inflation is. But in any event, uh, what you see here is from the point of view of 2022, uh, definitely uh, we were allocating a lot of inflation to these shocks. But by the same logic, in 22, uh, would be for inflation, not for the price level, but for inflation, uh, so long as 2023 and 24 did not see further shocks of this line, there should be a lot of easing in inflation in 23, just from the, these shocks uh, no longer being so big. Uh, and in, in the late 21, sorry, late, late 22, 
the projection was that by the end of 23, inflation would be at 3.3%. So we were going to go from 10 in Q4 22, 10 6 in October 22, to low threes in one year. So if you try to calibrate a, a Taylor rule or any other decision rule, uh, most of the time there's a big debate, okay, what is the inflation rate am I responding to? Is it this quarter's inflation rate, the next four quarters inflation rate, the one year ahead, the two year ahead? So putting in what inflation rate you put into your monetary policy reaction function matters quite a bit. And this is why the, the kind of uh, uh, understanding that with sectoral shocks, uh, the, the kind of pressure on inflation is different than if there was a persistent element like the labour market at, at play. Now, it turned out in, in 23, this inflation happened faster. There's a much bigger turnaround in energy markets than was expected. So, in fact, by the end of 23, inflation was at 2.7. So, so we basically went from 10.6 to 2.7. Eight percentage points of inflation in basically a year uh, went away. So uh, it's a big question for calibrating monetary policy how much you take that into account. And again, in expectation, in real time, uh, the ECB staff had about seven percentage points of inflation melting away. Um, so the right side said, OK, well, if those shocks ended in 22 mostly, why do we still have inflation now? And this is where, again, the labour market plays a role. So, so the right side shows uh, the wage dynamic modelled. Uh, um, and you see here that uh, there's a lagged wage adjustment, uh, which is ongoing. Um, and so this is why in Europe, because of the slow nature of wages, uh, we, we still have inflation for another year. So under the current forecast, inflation is more like mid twos, still for a number of months um, in terms of underlying inflation uh, before uh, lower wage growth next year eventually brings us back. So maybe what's interesting to note here is the tighter labour market is visible in the wage dynamic. So there is a, you know, an outcome of the uh, uh, tighter labour market in terms of stronger wage growth. But, and this is projected, if you see here, because it's projected for threat to protection horizon, that we will have a stronger labour market. Uh, but one way to think about this is this maybe increases the likelihood of hitting the inflation target rather than being chronically below the inflation target. So before the pandemic, we said, why, you know, why are wage increases so weak? And maybe wage increases would be more target consistent in the coming years, even when the uh, pandemic shocks and energy shocks roll away. OK, let me uh, use my last couple of minutes to talk about the, the balance sheets. Uh, and here, uh, it's, it's important to recognize First of all, the, the flows in this period, and then I'll talk about the, the outstanding stocks. Uh, so here, um, the, the way you think about the net lending, net borrowing uh, graph on the left, is basically before the pandemic, your area was running a chronic current account surplus of two point something. We're more or less back at that now. But you see in the, uh, in the pandemic, Initially, there's an increase in, in the current account surplus, the overall net, net, net lending. And then uh, when, when the terms of trade shock hit, that was absorbed to some extent by essentially uh, reducing our net lending to the rest of the world. So we were able to absorb the shock to some extent by that. But what you see here, of course, famously in the pandemic, uh, the households were protected with a big inflow uh, essentially, and firms to some extent uh, matched by a big uh, increase in, in government deficits. So there's a flow of funds from the government to the private sector during the pandemic. And uh, this is one of the big policy questions, wider than monetary policy, about uh, the allocation of, of uh, you know, who takes the hit in the pandemic and with this big uh, transfer for, from the government sector to households and firms. Okay, so, so that's a flow issue. In terms of uh, stock issues, again, if you're trying to calibrate a model, uh, what's important to think about in, in the middle chart is the uh, leverage levels for firms and households. And again, if you're running a model over 25 years or more, uh, compared to what? What you see here is that 
compared to previous tightening episodes before the great financial crisis, both households and firms in the area are a lot more leveraged. So leverage le rates of households and firms were a lot more leveraged now compared to earlier tightening cycles. But of course, uh, compared to some other benchmark points, it's lower. So host households are a lot less leveraged than compared to the aftermath of the financial crisis. And uh, firms, um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, you know, uh, um, have, se have seen this volatility in the pandemic, but the, the trend is still a lot more leveraged in the firm sector. So it was an open question when we were trying to think about calibration monetary policy, how responsive would firms be and households uh, to changes in interest rates? Because of course the balance sheet matters quite a bit. And again, you're always comparing to previous tightening episodes with that. One interesting issue in, in the, but again, maybe relates to the sectoral shocks, it is in the first year of high inflation, firms uh, saw a really big increase in profitability. So the third uh, panel there is the profitability of firms. And in 2022, this went way above normal levels. So, uh, of, you know, uh, this matter, you know, uh, there's a lot of nuances and complications behind this. But what it does mean is the first year of monetary policy tightening, the amount of firms who didn't need to borrow was higher than normal because their internal resources were elevated in 22. Uh, that's much less true in, in 23 and even uh, less true now. So you do have to think about the, the kind of uh, status of firms uh, throughout the transmission. Uh, and then maybe on the network of households, it's important to remember financial and non-financial assets. So what you see here is in uh, 22, they definitely took losses on their bond portfolios. The financial assets were big capital losses. But in 22, the value of houses was still going up. So, you know, in overall terms, it was a little bit of a wash. In fact, net wealth probably was going up in 22. But in 23, the housing market in the euro area aggregate uh, uh, delivered negative returns. Uh, and so 23, there's more of a wealth effect than in, than in 22. Uh, I don't show 21, but it maybe could have been interesting. Uh, and then maybe the last one I'll make is on uh, the banking system. Uh, we've had throughout this period, okay, uh, banks did a lot of adjusting, but we've not seen any kind of credit crunch. We've not seen any kind of doom loop between sovereigns and banks. And a pretty big balance sheet difference is compared to the uh, 10 years ago, the capital ratio of banks is just so much higher. So in terms of, because if you, again, if you're doing empirics in your area, how banks and the banking system responds to monetary policy will be heavily infected by the fact that we had weak banks for a number of years. But now after a long period of uh, macroprudential and supervisory regulation, uh, banks have been a, you know, a lot more capitalized. So in terms of their ability to withstand losses, uh, it is very different. And so what we've had this time is a fairly stable transmission uh, of monetary policy uh, compared to that. Okay, I've rambled, I've been discursive, I've moved all over the place, but that's because I don't need to get uh, past a referee. So I, I, can, I, can, uh, I can be much uh, wider in my perspective. But let me uh, conclude. So what I would say is, uh, what are our criteria? And the Jackson Hole Conference is about the effectiveness of monetary policy. And of course, as Massimo said, there's going to be different views about the timing of the, how quick central banks should have hiked. But once we started hiking, I think the conclusion I have right now is monetary policy has been effective. Inflation came down to two point something very quickly, and it's on its way to target uh, about a year from now. So it's been a fairly timely return for inflation to the target. We've had uh, inflation expectations uh, remaining stable. And what's important is that also the expectation was it wouldn't take too long to get back to target. We've seen a transmission to the financial system, and I think again for Europe, the nuance of what bit of this is just escape from the lower bound versus what is a cyclical uh, tightening. Uh, we've seen transmission which remains ongoing uh, uh, to the economy. And I think behind everything though is, in, you do need to make a call about 
what or where is the origin of inflation? Where is the momentum of inflation in 22, 23? And if you take the sectoral view of inflation, so in other words, it was not inherently sticky. There was a lot of reasons to believe inflation would fall back fairly quickly. Then the scale of the monetary policy response uh, would look different uh, compared to a model where you felt uh, to be a lot more persistence in the inflation process. So with that, uh, I think there's a few minutes for free Q&A, so I'm happy to see if you have any comments or, or questions uh, for, for my next uh, speech on this topic. Hi, Volker. Uh, yep. Yeah. It's on, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, broad speech and insights. And uh, I have two uh, questions, brief questions. One, you raised that point already on the quantitative easing, you know, what to expect uh, in terms of quantitative tightening. Right? You showed that TLTRO has really declined quickly. I mean, two things on this. One, it seems that TLTROs are quite different in the sense that these are basically longer term liquidity to the banks at a very attractive interest rate. And when this ECB tightened interest rates, they also removed that extremely attractive interest rate, you know, this, this kind of subsidy, which made a lot of sense at the time, uh, even though it was contested. But it, it's still, it's in the very strongly in the interest uh, cost uh, of central bank lending to banks. So probably different effects from the QE, um, where you purchase large amounts of assets to reduce um, the, the premia. And so if we look at past estimates of the QE, um, they seem to have been lower than what we were hoping for or, um, or in terms of the, expect, uh, the effect. And now with the quantitative tightening, <coughs> you have, you know, but there were big announcement effects, I would say, at least that, right? There's a number of interesting papers here at the time from the ECB also. Uh, but it's lo looking forward, given that the quantitative tightening uh, on the asset purchase programs is proceeding very slowly, or fairly slowly, or cl cl I think at the Fed they wanted a glacial uh, speed. So maybe, so I, and it's not in a crisis, right? The announcement effect was in the crisis with the easing. So should we expect much less in terms of the impact on the tightening than we had on the easing? Um, and the other question, brief question on the surveys, uh, you pointed out that the how, I mean the professionals, they completely seem to miss the persistence in the increase of inflation. So I, I, I would be reluctant to give, uh, to, to learn, mu to, to, to be sure that we learn much from, from their expectations. In terms of the household expectations, you pointed out that they say the three year for the households are down to 2%. And I just saw, uh, the Buddhist bank has this survey where they remain at three or three to 4%. And so I'm wondering if the people surveyed by the Bundesbank are also in the ECB survey. Okay, uh, so, so, so let, let me take the expectations one first uh, and then co go back to the balance sheet. Uh, I don't disagree with expert surveys, so whether it's the professional forecasters or the survey of monetary analysts, uh, you, you do have to take into account they come from the same gene pool as we do. Uh, so, so the kind, but what would be interesting is it would uh, be quite troubling if they came up. So, so it's, a, it's a basic test. If they came up with, with a very different signal to us, that, that would be something. So the fact that by and large they don't, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't overweight on that, but it's, there is an element of, of uh, at least one, one headache is avoided, a, a big mismatch. Uh, between the external view and the internal view. Of course, uh, as you know, Volker, right now, I mean, there's, a, there's some difference between market views and uh, our view about near-term inflation, which is probably slightly different. Uh, yeah, there's some methodological differences, I think, between the Bundesbank survey uh, and our survey. And I, I don't think it's, I mean, I showed medians here, we look at everything. Um, but what's important is probably comparing to, to some benchmark. I mean, I don't know with the Bundesbank survey, what they were saying before the pandemic. But to the extent, you know, uh, the, the fear that the, the inflation surge would permanently alter inflation expectations is probably the, the key test, not the exact level, because, you know, again, we, we don't expect them to be professional uh, macro forecasters. Um, 
And there are important country differences. Uh, uh, Yuri, when he was here last week for the other conference, you know, had a, some interesting uh, char charts on, on country differences in, in the EU area. Um, and, but as I said in the presentation, I think it's a really unsettled area, how we use expectations uh, in our monetary policy process. Uh, I mean, we, we use them a lot, but it's not mechanical. So it's, okay, wh why, are, why, why do people think this? What's going on here? Can it be reduced to a simple adaptive updating rule or something? So, so I think in terms of, uh, again, uh, hopefully 20 years from now looking back, how we use expectations data uh, will be more informative than, than right now. I mean, I, on the balance sheet, I, I think it's important to think about both the asset side and the liability side. So clearly, a, a Telto program is quite different to asset purchases in terms of the impact uh, on the respective asset markets. So, so whether the bond market, uh, mechanically the direct effect of the bond market from asset purchasing versus uh, credit via Teltro. But on the liability side, it's an open question. So on the, li we, the liability, of course, uh, first is central bank reserves. So we inject central bank reserves via purchasing bonds. We inject central bank reserves by, by doing a Teltro program. We inject through our refinancing operations, which are, of course, roughly small. So again, uh, this is going to be, I think, very important to study. Does it make a difference or in what ways does it make a difference to roll off two trillion in, in central bank reserves from Teltro's concluding versus, versus rolling off two trillion from you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the decline in, in an asset portfolio? And this is, I think, a, a very live area for, 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 for research. So at the very least, the fact that banks have adapted their lending standards is consistent with a more kind of a, uh, conservatism about liquidity abundance. Uh, and I think this is going to be, again, an uh, inter interesting on ongoing issue. And very importantly, though, the QE versus QT study is all else equal. So when QE was happening, it's because there's no room or not much room left for interest rate cuts. So there's a big stance impact of QE. If it's got, you know, there was a margin there. With QT, we're also adjusting the interest rate. So the stance impact of QT, it's in, as you say, it's in the background. It, it's, it's a, so then, uh, conditional on the stance being delivered by the policy rate, you have to think, okay, how does the kind of uh, withdrawal of us from the bond market through the announcement effect, but also mechanically on an ongoing basis, you know, every, uh, every week the bond market, people have to calculate, okay, how much is on the books of the ECB, how much has to be absorbed by the private sector, and how much of a risk premium do I attach now to the, with, the, with, the, with the ratio of central bank holdings kind of coming down over time. So I would leave it for an open area for research, but what I would say is chronically, you have to adjust for the policy rate. So when we started, tightening or adjusting at December 21, there was many studies saying, uh, keep on doing QE even while you're tightening. Not studies necessarily, but opinion pieces and so on. Because they were fearful no one would show up to the European bond market. But actually, when the rate rate goes up, people are interested in buying bonds. So in terms of, I think uh, any study like that has to take into account the, the uh, uh, the level of policy rates and, and the overall stance. So please. Hi. Uh, no. Hi. Uh, Carlo Boffa from Politico. Um, I have a question. Um, you showed the, uh, the uh, chart on the survey of professional forecasters that still see um, inflation at 2% some year ahead. Uh, that's not the case, for example, in the uh, in the option market, where um, there is a 38% chance that inflation in the next five years will be 1.5%. So now you are uh, starting, or you've just started, um, your uh, uh, strategy update. And I wanted to ask, what makes you sure that once you will have done your strategy update, you will be in a different world that you were in 2021, since you know the chance of 
inflation, at least the, the chance given by market that inflation will be undershooting your target are quite sizable. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, uh, l last week at the expectations conference, I showed that chart basically of the option, uh, with the option market now is essentially increasingly two-sided. So they're pricing a risk of inflation being below the target, they're pricing a risk of inflation being above the target, and the balance, as you go further out, is more to the downside. Uh, so uh, all I can say is, is our 2021 uh, strategy uh, is crystal clear. Uh, the 2% target is, is symmetric. Um, and essentially, that's, that's going to be our kind of uh, uh, firm anchor for policy, is, is to make sure uh, we neither overshoot nor undershoot on a kind of open-ended basis. Uh, so, so that, that is uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, what we're going to do. I mean, the market also, yeah, uh, uh, we take note, put it like that, we take note of, of what the options markets are doing. Um, um, and of course, it's an insurance market, but in terms of our policy, it's going to be built around the symmetric 2% objective. So sorry, over here in the middle, please. Yeah. Hello, Fabrizio Venditti from the Bank of Italy. I had a question on your uh, view on the inflation, sort of the composition. There is a heated debate within the euro system whether supply shocks were the main determinant of inflation or demand shocks, and uh, the composition showed this sort of excuses this question because it goes back sort of to observables, food, energy, and so on. Um, and I think that the composition has a lot of weight onto supply effects, which speaks well to the events, to the sequence of events we saw. But I think one question always comes to my mind is how come we saw profits going up so prominently uh, during the inflation episode? How did profit make their way to the economy if demand was not there to, in a sense, to accommodate them? And I think one uh, interesting way to see this question is more than which shock was more important is which shock was more important in which period when and I want to to know your view on this thing okay so so in, in uh, 21 and 22 if you read our monetary policy statements in that time period uh, we, we did have demand uh, playing a role so it, we it's not the case that that uh, uh, it's a supply-only story. Uh, and in 2022, 20, when inflation got really high, and I showed you in, in the charts, we have this really strong consumption from basically March 22 to October 22. So those two quarters, Q2, Q3, 22, really strong consumption. So that was essentially demand being quite strong uh, and what I said in my presentation was, one factor there was just pandemic reopening. People had money in their pockets, and now having been basically barred from consuming tourism, hospitality, going out, uh, there was a kind of a strong demand component in 22. So we have this overdetermined issue. The exact same months when the war happened, the exact same months when the gas market went, you know, really in this non-linear way, we also, in parallel, had this big demand recovery in services. And again, from a, in terms of allocating what to what, of course, if we already had had a restrictive monetary policy at that time, or if we had raised rates very quickly, the question is, could some of that pandemic demand have been suppressed in 22? And equally, at what cost? What kind of uh, impact would, would that pan? And of course, at Sintra, we had the uh, Giannone uh, Primaceri paper, uh, which w w went through to some extent. But there's other ways to allocate the data as well. So what I would say is 2022, uh, understanding that year, when there was strong demand and interest rates were still, were being moved up, but from a fairly low level, is an important year to, to understand. Um, uh, then profits, uh, 
Did you have profit? So in, in some sectors, yes, it was basically opportunism. But in other sectors, it's essentially global price takers. So the, the biggest, uh, I showed a chart, I think I've shown a chart where basically the energy firms had the biggest jump in profits. It's because of, you know, pricing's at the marginal, marginal cost, but if your average cost of energy is a lot lower, you made a lot of money that year. Uh, goods producers, global demand for goods being very high, so even though you couldn't produce very much, the, the price at which you could sell those goods could be quite high. So there's also a, a global pricing uh, of those sectors. But what's also true, which I do think is for, for the models, is when you have slow wage adjustment, why did Europe have such slow wage adjustment? Is temporarily firms are making money because uh, they're able to raise prices, but a big part of their cost is going to only go up over time. Now, I think they knew it was partly temporary because they knew wages would catch up eventually. Um, but I do think, again, that's a, a big area for future research. I should stop in order to, to let the rest of the uh, conference uh, proceed. So, Maspo, who's next, or is there a break? So. Okay, okay, so there's a, very good. So the coffee, I think, is it? Okay, very good.